Thank you very much for your attendance. Uh, my name is Philip Lipsy, and I direct the Center for the Study of Global Japan at the University of Toronto. Welcome to today's event, Maritime Security Issues in Asia and uh, Japan Security Policy. I would like to begin by thanking our co-sponsor for today's event, the Consulate General of Japan in Toronto, as well as Mio Otsuka, our events and program coordinator, and Daria Dumbads and Adam Bell of the Monk School for their administrative support. Before we begin, I would like to deliver a land acknowledgement. We wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Following the panel presentations, uh, we will hold a Q&A session. Please use the built-in Q&A feature on Zoom or email csgj.monk at utoronto.ca to submit your questions. Um, and you should feel free to submit the questions uh, after the event or during the presentations. It won't disrupt uh, the panelists in any way. Uh, so before we turn to our panel, it is my great pleasure to welcome Consul General Sasayama Takuma, uh, who will deliver some opening remarks related to the event. Very good evening. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, today's seminar organized by Center for the Study of Global Japan is about China. And the theme is Maritime Security Issue in Asia and Japan Security Policies. Now today, everyone, everyone wants to know what Beijing is all about and what they're thinking, what their way of doing, what their, how to behave in the international society, etc., etc. Last year, I was looking for a Japanese academia who can explain plainly to us. And uh, one day I read about the book on China titled Chugoku no Kodo Genri, or The Principle of How China Behaves. It was written by Japanese uh, young woman academia. I tried to get in touch with her. She replied very quickly, and she was glad to get some connection with us. So that is the way how I get in touch with uh, Professor Masuro Chikako, Masuro Sensei. She was very easy to communicate, and I'm glad that she is here this evening. I knew some of uh, Japanese academia who studied maybe her or his entire life about China, but very few can explain to the English speaking or the Western society about China in English or other foreign languages. Masuo Sensei is one of the few who can really study about China and explain to them outside. Actually, I asked for an English resume of her book, but she said she's too busy to make one. So I decided to invite her to explain in English so that we can have a clearer idea about her thinking and maybe a hint about how China is thinking and will behave. I hope you can enjoy immensely about this seminar. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, uh, Consul General Sasayama. I would now like to introduce our very distinguished panel. Uh, I will keep the introductions brief in order to maximize time for our discussion as well as the Q&A. Uh, our first speaker will be Professor Masao Tichisako, who is Associate Professor at the Graduate School of Social and Cultural Studies at Kyushu University. She has published extensively on Chinese foreign policy, the international relations, 
of East Asia and Sino-Japanese relations. She is the author of the book, China Looks Back, Mao's Legacy in the Open Door Era from University of Tokyo Press, among many other important works. She obtained her PhD from the University of Tokyo and has prior affiliations with Waseda University, Harvard University, and the Japan Institute of International Affairs. She'll be followed by Jonathan Berkshire Miller, uh, who is a senior fellow with the Japan Institute of International Affairs, as well as the director of the Indo-Pacific Program and senior fellow at the McDonald Laurier Institute, among uh, many other affiliations. He previously spent about a decade working on economic and security issues related to Asia within the Canadian federal government, uh, particularly in the foreign ministry and the security community. He has published widely on topics related to security, defense, and geoeconomic issues in the Indo-Pacific in outlets such as foreign affairs, foreign policy, and the Globe and Mail, among many others. Our final speaker will be Eric Higginbotham, who is a principal research scientist at the Center for International Studies at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He is a leading expert of Asian security issues with publications in prominent journals like International Security and Foreign Affairs, along with several major books and edited volumes, including most recently, China Steps Out, Beijing's Major Power Engagement with the Developing World from Routledge in 2018. Eric obtained his PhD from MIT and was senior political scientist at the RAND Corporation prior to assuming his current position. So we very much look forward uh, to the panel presentations uh, as well as the uh, questions from the audience. So with, without further ado, uh, Professor Maso, the floor is yours. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for your kind introduction, Philip. Um, uh, it is my uh, great honor to be able to make a presentation here today. Um, uh, well, uh, Mr. Sasayama has mentioned that I have published uh, one uh, book, which is sold relatively well in Japan. But today, I'm and I, in that book, I tried to explain uh, explain to the Japanese public uh, why uh, Chinese people behave in different ways. Uh, comparing to the Japanese, but I talked too much on the cultural issues. Uh, I paid a lot of attention to the differences between the two cultures. So, and uh, that was meant, uh, that was written for the Japanese general public. And I thought it wasn't really suitable uh, to discuss that topic uh, today. So uh, today I'm going to pay more attention to, uh, the Jap uh, to the Chinese maritime policy, which I have uh, been trying to decipher for over the last uh, 10 years or more. Um, uh, let me show my slides. Well, um, today I have very long slides, so I will try to make it brief as possible. Um, I am Chisako Masu, and now I have been promoted to a professor in Kyushu University. So, uh, well, uh, the, uh, today's uh, seminar's topic is slightly different from my, uh, what I usually do, uh, because I usually pay more attention to China. So, uh, I think... Uh, uh, Regarding Japan's security policy, uh, I'm not a, the most uh, the uh, most suitable person to talk about, but probably uh, we can uh, discuss uh, ba uh, about it uh, based on uh, my presentation today. So uh, the question I uh, uh, pose uh, here. Um, well, actually, I uh, wrote the same thing in the uh, summary of uh, today's webinar. Uh, well. Uh, in 2012, China claimed that it was forced to regularize its Coast Guard's patrol surrounding the Senkaku or Daoyu Islands, uh, according to their uh, way of calling, because Japan, but the Japanese government purchased three of the features from a private owner. And this year, China again announced to regularize its military activities beyond the median lane of the Taiwan Strait, as its sovereignty was allegedly challenged by the island vis visit paid by Nancy Pelosi, the US Speaker of the House. So you can see um, uh, correlations uh, between the two events. Actually, um, uh, China has uh, their 
own sets of minds and they try they always try to justify uh, their behaviors uh, on the sea or even to the you know basically on um, the way they do uh, they way uh, the way they uh, handle um, external issues is quite similar uh, so they have a, a, a set of um, uh, uh, thinking uh, in a certain ways of thinking uh, in understanding and interpreting uh, uh, foreign policy and how to and also as to uh, on how to uh, manage the entire picture. Uh, but uh, but 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 by making whatever excuses, uh, China Chinese aggressive behaviors over the East Asian waters have been transforming the security environment of the Indo-Pacific. That's for sure. Uh, so uh, we need to think of think about what is China planning uh, planning to do in the ocean, uh, and for uh, to protect those. Uh, predict this, it is important to understand its domestic systems and its uh, to uh, and uh, its domestic administrative systems in particular. Um, I have been uh, focusing on China's bureaucratic system uh, and uh, uh, focusing on the state oceanic administration uh, that existed between 1964 and 2018. Uh, now it has, uh, through the uh, quite comprehensive uh, domestic reforms of the uh, state, uh, the state council, uh, it's uh, the this organization has been dissolved, and the largest part of it has moved to the Ministry of uh, Natural Resources. But uh, I think uh, you know uh, when we understand China, it is very important to understand that it's a huge country. And when China wants to do things, it cannot do in a very, very ad hoc way. It's a huge body. So uh, when it wants to achieve something, uh, the leaders of China usually try to use their domestic systems, the, the, bureau, um, the, uh, the bureaucracy, uh, which China has the longest history in the world, right? So uh, if we pay attention to what the bureaucracy is doing, uh, it pretty much tells you uh, what China intends to do in that field in the future. And uh, to decipher this, I have been uh, doing a lot of documentary research. Uh, I usually uh, convey a lot of interviews on other themes, but in terms of the maritime policy, I was uh, unable to do it because I uh, I am a Japanese and they uh, do like do not like to see the Japanese in this field. So uh, I could not convey many interviews. Unfortunately, uh, the only important one was. Uh, the 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 only opportunity I had was to have an interview with the captain who uh, led uh, China's first um, patrol to the Senkaku territorial water in 2008. So uh, with uh, other than that uh, opportunity, I basically uh, tried to uh, understand uh, Chinese policy uh, with uh, based on their documents. So uh, from here, uh, I would like to um, talk, uh, well, I would like to uh, give you a little bit of background on uh, China's understanding on the maritime order. Well, uh, so uh, China, well, no matter <laughs> what, but uh, when China uh, tries to deal with the world, it usually carries a very deep uh, victimhood mentality. And it's uh, particularly true on its maritime policy. Uh, China regards that uh, China has been uh, bullied uh, by the Western powers as well as Japan. Uh, and uh, uh, for the PRC, the maritime domain has been uh, a very dangerous area for many years, uh, since, especially since uh, 2050, uh, when uh, China, start, uh, Ch China participated in the Korean War and fought with, with the Americans. Um, and then uh, Vietnam, Vietnamese War, uh, Indochina War continues. Um, uh, here I uh, brought two maps uh, on the UNCLOS, 
the left one was drawn by uh, Filipino scholars, and the right one is uh, was carried on PLA daily in uh, 2001, uh, 2010. Can you see the difference? It's uh, both are on the uh, UNCLOS order, international order. Uh, you know which. Can you see which line is the important? Is the most important for each uh, map? On left, you can see well, this is the longest line, so this must be very important, right? So uh, this is the border between the territorial sea and others. So uh, you know, up until here, this uh, coastal country can have. Um, sovereignty. And beyond that, you know, uh, in the exclusive economic zone or continental shelf, it can only have uh, sovereign rights, which is usually referred to economic rights, right? And then uh, beyond that, there is high seas. So this is the map uh, depicted by the Filipino scholars. And on the right, uh, can you see uh, which line is the most important? See, uh, this is the longest line, right? And what is this? This is the border of exclusive economic zone and continental shelf. So, and up until here, uh, China, well, from, uh, from the coast to here, uh, China calls it as national jurisdiction water. The, the notion of jurisdiction water is very important for China. And China actually calls this water uh, as maritime territory within the domestic context. So uh, they call entire, you know, this area as territory. You can see that China's uh, notion on the sea is quite similar to what you have on the territory, the land territory. And uh, so uh, in this map, uh, there is no difference, you know, clear difference between sovereignty and sovereign rights. But uh, China tends to understand the entire area is, un is yours and you know, you're under your uh, sovereignty. So this is the huge difference we have in China. Uh, so uh, usually when China and the United States have uh, disputes on the sea, uh, it happens between the border of the territorial water and this, uh, and this uh, the border of jurisdiction water. So this is the very ambiguous area uh, we have. And uh, in terms of the sea, uh, China took Parasol Island away from South Vietnam in 1974, uh, just before uh, it was kicked out from Vietnam, from South Vietnam. Uh, well, actually, that was one year before that. And uh, six features in Spratly Islands from Vietnam in, in United Vietnam in 1988, and Mischief Reef in uh, and Scarborough Shoal. Uh, Mischief Reef was 94 and Scarborough Shoal in 2012, both from Philippines. So, uh, and uh, where are uh, China claiming as jurisdiction water? Uh, well, uh, China has never uh, released its complete map, so we don't know its claim. Uh, we know uh, that China uh, has. Uh, uh, de uh, delineated this nine so-called nine dash line in the South uh, China Sea, right? So it's about this area. We don't know about China's claim on Taiwan because it has never uh, depicted any of it. Um, but probably it extends from uh, uh, to, extends at least two hundred nautical miles from uh, the coast, uh, the eastern coast of Taiwan. So it, it is probably like this. And uh, uh, in East China Sea, uh, similar to uh, South China Sea, China claims almost all. <laughs> you know, uh, of course, uh, the legal foundation is different, uh, but you know that's always the principle that China demands the most. So uh, here, um, China says uh, there is a ditch in East China Sea. 
Uh, actually, the ditch is much deep, deeper here, but China uh, insists that this is the line of um, the continental shelf. And uh, China demands uh, entire area there. Um, what makes it very confused is that uh, Senkaku Islands uh, are on the continental shelf, China claims. So if it is if it belongs to Japan and if China uh, if it belongs to China, China, uh, Japan, logically China needs to share share the entire continental shelf it claims with the Japanese. So uh, especially after uh, to, uh, 1996, when China ratified the UNCLOS, uh, China uh, all of a sudden uh, increased its claim on the Senkaku Islands. Before that, it was very si uh, silent, except the case in uh, 2000, uh, uh, case in uh, 1992, when uh, China uh, uh, ratified, uh, uh, made this uh, territorial sea, uh, uh, the law of ter territorial sea, and uh, claimed uh, Senkaku as a part of Chinese territory for the first time. So uh, uh, through those uh, China's uh, jurisdiction water, uh, all China's maritime neighbors are oppressed by the same uh, security pressure from China. Because uh, the area is so vast, it's 3 million kilometers, uh, uh, 3 million square uh, kilometers. And 51% of it duplicates with other countries' claims. So uh, actually by claiming such a huge area, uh, China invited a lot of international disputes. And uh, of course, uh, the duplicated area is about the size of Mongolia. So you can see how big it is actually. So, uh, well, I have, I, I also included some slides on Senkaku Islands, but uh, I'm going to skip them <laughs> uh, because due to the time constraints. Uh, but I, I just wanted to say that China usually tries to use history to justify uh, its position, but uh, China tries to collect history in a very ad, ad, ad hoc ways. And the way it uses history is not really uh, fully uh, based on the truth or academ uh, from an academic standpoint. For example, uh, when uh, China uh, justified its uh, regular patrol around Senkaku territorial water uh, in 2012, he said uh, Japan broke. Uh, the promise, but actually the promise or the consensus reached in uh, 1970s between the leaders of the two sides, but actually it was never reached. And uh, I have made a lot of study on this, but uh, it was, the truth was create, recreated within China after uh, the late 1990s. So uh, the way it treats history is very ad hoc and it's not very trustful. Uh, it's the, basically the same thing in all areas, uh, no matter Taiwan or uh, South China Sea. Well, uh, from here, I wanted to uh, mention a little, uh, uh, little uh, I wanted to explain uh, how China has been establishing uh, its maritime administration, uh, especially uh, since uh, the uh, beginning of uh, 21st century. Well, uh, here I paid a pretty much a big focus on the state oceanic administration. Uh, this uh, uh, body was within the was under the State Council uh, of China, and uh, its mission was to secure uh, China's national interests uh, both in its maritime territory and uh, the international zone. So, uh, Arc for example, Arctic policy has been under uh, this organization too. And uh, it has, uh, because uh, it was under the PLA in 70s, uh, it has uh, the SOA, the State of Oceanic Administration has had a very close relationship with the PLA Navy. Um, well, uh, SOA, but SOA in general was a very weak, small organization at first. Actually, uh, it tried to use uh, anti-Japan nationalism within China uh, for the organizational expansion. 
So uh, this, uh, the very small incident that happened in uh, East China Sea between Japan and North Korea in 2001 was actually used by SOA uh, so that uh, the SOA uh, actually asked the central leadership to allow them uh, to give them a bigger authority uh, to monitor uh, the jurisdiction water. Uh, because, uh, well, uh, in their understanding, well, uh, I, I don't think I have time to explain about this incident, but uh, they saw, uh, well, uh, they saw that the Japan is actually trying to use weapons against China and try to invade China, uh, and this is this was the first case, uh, first very important case. Uh, Japan used the weapons against foreign. Uh, parties uh, since the world, since the end of the World War II, so uh, and uh, you you can well at that time I think uh, the central leadership didn't pay much attention to this, but you know uh, if you remember Sino-Japanese relationship uh, around that period, uh, Koizumi uh, Prime Minister Koizumi took power, and he kept visiting Yasukuni Shrine every year. And that really infringed uh, China's anti-Japan nationalism. So uh, in the end, SOA uh, was very successful in using this uh, public uh, Chinese public opinion against Japan and, uh, and uh, sought, uh, sought permission from the central leadership to expand its maritime activities. And uh, what uh, was significant was that uh, installation of uh, patrol, uh, regular patrolling system in the East China Sea. Uh, so under SOA, there was uh, 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 China's uh, maritime, uh, China maritime surveillance. Today is China's Coast Guard. Uh, today it is called China, uh, China Coast Guard. Uh, so uh, well. Under SOA, uh, there was this Coast Guard, and in 2006, uh, it was successful in gaining the permission from the central government to uh, initiate a new patrolling system in the East China Sea. Okay, uh, but you know, if you do it in uh, one part of uh, China's jurisdiction water, if you're a bureaucrat, then you want to do it in the entire water, right? So in the next year, in 2007, uh, China uh, expanded the same system, uh, both in um, yeah, uh, in the South China Sea. I think uh, uh, when uh, in 2006, uh, China initiated the system uh, in East China Sea, as well as in uh, Yellow Sea. Uh, where uh, China face, uh, faces with South Korea. So uh, within one year, uh, the system was uh, expanded. But uh, in reality, uh, Japan Coast Guard was relatively stronger, or much stronger at that time than the Chinese Coast Guard, right? But in South China Sea, uh, they, uh, the, those uh, Coast Guards had been very weak or didn't exist at that time. So it was much easier for the China Coast Guard to uh, start uh, using the force <laughs> to tackle against the fish, uh, foreign vessels. So in 2007, uh, Chinese China Coast Guard started to uh, kick out uh, the Vietnamese uh, fishing vessels from certain uh, areas, and it, it uh, gradually um, started to expand those activities. So by 2009, uh, in, uh, South China, in Southeast Asia, uh, you know, China, uh, China threat perception, uh, you know, China threat theory has came back. And uh, in, you know, if you remember uh, in early 2000s, China was very successful in making a lot of diplomatic negotiations with the South China, Southeastern countries. So uh, the South China Sea issue was relatively quiet, but in latter half of uh, 2000s, uh, all of a sudden, you know, this issue became very big because of uh, China Coast Guard's activities uh, to use actual force against the foreign fishing vessels. 
and uh, by uh, two by December two thousand eight, uh, with the uh, huge anti-Japan uh, uh, anti-Japan nationalism uh, within China, SOA uh, uh, or uh, China Coast Guard actually uh, uh, made the first uh, patrol uh, first patrol into the territorial water of Senkakus. And according to my interview with the captain at that time, oh, the they what well, they didn't uh, the SOA didn't seek permission uh, from the central uh, leadership at that time. But uh, they uh, argued that when uh, this uh, patrolling system was installed, the central leadership have agreed to uh, for, uh, agreed uh, the China Coast Guard to convey uh, such an activity. And because of the Navy's uh, backup. Uh, with SOA, uh, the central government, uh, central leadership uh, gave up to punish the captain, uh, as the rumors say. So uh, uh, because those activities expanded, uh, the maritime issues surrounding China became very big uh, by uh, 2010 or 2012. Uh, I'm not going to uh, uh, explain about those details because I, I suppose everybody knows this. Um, uh, but I think I need to explain a little bit about this. Uh, China doesn't, well, and uh, you know, for the central leadership, the SOA's activities seem to be very dangerous in some way because they were out of control. So um, I think, um, in my understanding, it is a Xi Jinping's initiative to regain uh, uh, the control over the issue. And uh, uh, well, uh, at that time, China was uh, uh, legis legislating uh, this island protection law. Uh, it was effectuated in 2010. I think it doesn't have much relationship with Xi Jinping at that time. But uh, it's, an, uh, it's a new law to protect uh, China's claiming uh, uh, islands. Uh, but and based on this law, uh, China cr uh, created a lot of uh, administrative uh, measures uh, to control uh, the islands uh, China claims. And based on the you know, uh, island protection law, uh, China initiated new uh, protection, island protection program uh, in 2012, actually. Uh, well, the targeted year was from 2011 to 2020, but actually uh, this was uh, created, uh, this was publicized in 2012. And uh, I can see a clear, uh, interest of Xi Jinping about this issue, uh, you will see. Uh, in this, uh, China uh, created much details planned, detailed plans to uh, enhance its control over uh, many islands. Uh, I'm not going to tell you about the details, but uh, basically this was the new system. So uh, uh, China created, and uh, basically you have to follow the usage, uh, the, uh, the central government as well as the local governments uh, clarify the usage of each island and you have to follow that. And in this system, uh, you can see that uh, those, uh, well, first of all, habited islands are all uh, habited islands and within inhabited islands, islands for regular usage, are um, managed by the provincial local governments. Uh, but uh, there are uh, inhabited islands for special usage. Uh, so that was a new category. And they, there were three kinds of them. And one of them was islands for defense usage. And uh, it's, uh, well, it didn't, the law doesn't say anything, but because all other islands were controlled by the central authority uh, or uh, local authorities, uh, you can uh, assume that those are managed mainly by the PLA. And uh, the, the new system also created, well, the new system basically banned China's reclamation on any islands 
unless it is it was very necessary for the country to do. And if a country needs to uh, have landfill of the islands, it has to be discussed between the uh, responsible authority within the uh, state council and the military. Uh, you know, uh, that means the SOA and the PLA. And at that time, uh, actually the person who was uh, in charge of uh, creating this new system uh, was the director of SOA, Liu Cikui. And uh, he was a former subordinate of Xi Jinping in Fujian province. And I think uh, he, this man was very important because, uh, well, after he created this system and uh, laid the foundation uh, for uh, the system, uh, he was reappointed as the governor of Hainan province. That means he was uh, heading the actual reclamation plan in Hainan province because you know uh, those uh, seven features in uh, South China Sea was uh, under uh, Hainan province uh, in the China's domestic administration system. So uh, you can see that uh, within this island protection program, uh, China lay by using this program, China uh, laid the foundation uh, for reclamation of the seven features in the South China Sea. Well, uh, 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 in this, well, when China uh, created this new system, uh, it released so many documents, and uh, the ones uh, that are in relation to the PLA was not published. However, the ones related to the uh, provincial and central governments were all published at that time. So uh, by uh, uh, deleting those, you can see which islands are uh, left uh, for the PLA to um, uh, maneuver. And uh, you can see that uh, China was uh, also creating uh, plans for uh, the Parasol and Spratly Islands. Uh, the Spratly ones are not publicized, but the ones on Parasol Islands say that it's it, it is uh, that they are going to be um, that the islands are going to be the intermediate, uh, the connective uh, connecting uh, zone. Uh, so for what you know? <laughs> and now you, we see uh, Hainan Island was developed as the China's free uh, trade uh, zone. And then uh, there's uh, Parasol Islands and then uh, the reclamation, uh, reclam reclamation Islands in the edge of uh, Spratly Islands. And those are, uh, of course, the islands of defense use uh, as I uh, write in pink here. So uh, of course, uh, they are the islands for military use. So uh, China doesn't, when China wants to do something, it doesn't do in an ad hoc way. It usually has very clear plans to achieve its goals because it's a huge body and uh, it's, it has so many uh, bureaucrats within the system. And in order to uh, consolidate the power of the bureaucracy, uh, leaders have to you know, uh, create those plans uh, in order to mobilize them. So uh, from here, I would like to mention what is happening recently. Well, well, I think uh, you have seen this uh, graph uh, in many uh, times. Uh, this shows uh, uh, how many times uh, China, well, in red, uh, China uh, Chinese uh, Coast Guard vessels have uh, intruded uh, the uh, territorial sea of the Senka, around Senkaku Islands. And uh, the blue lines uh, uh, is uh, for the contiguous zones. Um, uh, you can see that the number here uh, have upgraded uh, in the last uh, three years or so. So uh, more and more vessels uh, are coming from China into the uh, contiguous zone uh, surrounding Senkakus. But it doesn't mean that the uh, vessels are uh, the existence of vessels surrounding the territorial sea is decreasing. Actually, um, uh, those vessels uh, that are that once come into the territorial water stay lo much longer 
recently, uh, they have established uh, uh, continuous 64 hours uh, records, uh, unfortunately. And uh, what makes us very worried is that uh, the Chinese uh, Coast Guard vessels began to chase Japanese fishing vessels uh, around about two and a half years ago. And uh, now, well, uh, China claims, uh, uh, China, well, uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi has also mentioned that uh, Japanese uh, fishing vessels are challenging, actually. Um, but, uh, and um, those uh, vessels are uh, infringing uh, the risks surrounding uh, Senkaku Islands. But, you know, they've been fishing there for many years. It's China who is uh, who has uh, chasing those. And I think uh, Wang Yi has mentioned that uh, the uh, right wings of Japan uh, took uh, the fishing vessels of, of those, uh, those fishing vessels and, and tried to enter uh, the territorial waters. So China is forced to uh, chase them, but it's not really true. Uh, nowadays, all the Japanese fishing vessels uh, are chased uh, by the uh, China Coast Guard. So it's becoming uh, very, very uh, uh, dangerous. Uh, and I, I think uh, you also know that in 2018, uh, China Coast Guard uh, was moved uh, to the chain of command under uh, the central military uh, 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 the uh, 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 Central Military Commission. Um, so nowadays it is a part of armed force uh, and uh, it is directed uh, only by the uh, military people. And uh, uh, we, uh, in, in last month, uh, we have seen uh, the large scale uh, missile uh, the military drills surrounding Taiwan uh, Island. And uh, Japan, uh, China boosted uh, five uh, missiles into uh, the Japanese uh, uh, EEZ. And it also boost, uh, sh shot one, uh, another missile uh, very close to Yonaguni Island. Oh, Yonaguni is here, so uh, it uh, shot another one here. Well, Japan didn't mention to, uh, the Japanese government uh, didn't mention about it, but you know, uh, in Yonaguni, there is a, um, a self-defense force uh, base nowadays. So uh, I think uh, the uh, Chinese side tried to uh, send message uh, <laughs> uh, to the Japanese, uh, we can always shut uh, we can always shoot uh, the Yonaguni base in Japan. So uh, this was a big event uh, for us as well. And uh, what makes us very worried is that uh, there is an increasing joint activities by China, uh, Chinese and Russians uh, around Japan. Uh, so uh, those are uh, the joint activities uh, conducted uh, by the two uh, navies in uh, June, but uh, we are seeing increasing similar activities around uh, the Japanese islands. So uh, there are several difficulties uh, in, uh, often discussed in Japan uh, to tackle with the growing uh, China's threat. Um, uh, the first one is how can we tackle with China's salami slicing tactics without uh, providing it excuses to upgrade its uh, activities. Well, uh, if well, China has been uh, you know, uh, taking a lot of new measures, but when Japan uh, takes a new measure, uh, like uh, purchasing uh, you know, three islands uh, from uh, you know, Senkaku owners, uh, you know, China uses it as an excuse to expand uh, its uh, um, uh, forceful activities. So uh, I think uh, within Japanese government, uh, there are certain, you know, a, lo a lot of people who are afraid of those things happening. Um, but at the same time, uh, in face, uh, facing with China's growing activities, uh, people are discussing if uh, Japan Coast Guard 
enough or do they have enough uh, capability to tackle with uh, China's activities? Because you know now uh, Chinese Coast Guard is a part of uh, the uh, military force within China. And uh, uh, there is a hotline discussed, not uh, built yet, between uh, China, uh, China's uh, mil uh, P between the PLA and uh, the Japan uh, Japan uh, uh, Japanese Self Defense Force, but there is none uh, between those uh, coast guards, and it's never discussed. And another one is that how can we deal with uh, China's gray zone tactics, such as to mobilize a great number of militia at once? Uh, or uh, the new uh, issue is that how can we deal with the unmanned uh, aerial uh, vehicles? You know, there is no legal framework. We don't know if we can, for example, shoot them. You know, if we shoot them, uh, does it uh, understood as a military shooting? Or, you know, uh, we don't know anything. Well, there's no uh, international legal framework in terms of UAVs. So, um, and uh, by now, um, the police, uh, the Japan Coast Guards, uh, is not uh, doing any work in terms of defense. It's not an organization who does the defense. So in the name of policing or maintaining the order, uh, it's been patrolling around Senkaku Islands. Uh, in order not to provoke China, uh, people discuss that Japan has to uh, continue this work. Uh, of course, uh, in case of um, you know, uh, you know, any emergencies, uh, uh, the self-defense force can support uh, the uh, Japan Coast Guards, uh, but, you know, it has to get permission from the central leadership of Japan, of course. Of course, uh, they, people try to make it speed up, but uh, we don't know if, it, if that is enough. And, uh, uh, you know, Ch when China is coming, uh, 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 there are people who discuss that we should make the defense work uh, instead of this policy. And uh, of course, we uh, discuss how do we do if China invades Taiwan uh, and uh, when the US is so busy and cannot really support Japan, if anything happens around Senkaku, what are we going to do? Um, so uh, uh, those are uh, the discussions discussions we have in Japan. Well, uh, uh, because of the time limitation, I will go very quickly. Um, but uh, I have a question: If this those activities, uh, those uh, preparations, is enough for uh, Japan? Because, uh, well, you know, as I have mentioned, uh, China is you know uh, accumulating those uh, domestic measures over the years. Um, I have seen uh, China has been accumulating its maritime measures over the last, uh, especially the five years or so. And uh, by you also using uh, the fishery reforms, uh, very clear connections with the military use of those fishing vessels. Uh, China can now uh, use uh, the satellite force to give commands to the every fishing vessel in China, in uh, of, of the Chinese. And uh, it's also using, uh, creating a lot of application technology. Uh, this is a, a data application example uh, to predict good fishing grounds uh, for uh, red squid in North Pacific. So, so the by use by providing those data to the fishing uh, fishermen, China Chinese authority is uh, recreating its uh, uh, re uh, relationship with the, those Chinese fishing vessels. And at the same time, uh, China is creating, uh, starting from last year, China is creating national territorial and spatial program that also oversees the entire jurisdiction water. And under this, uh, China is creating a new spatial infrastructure as the background of national territorial and spatial program. And uh, this uses a lot of uh, satellite technology and also a lot of under, well, uh, the satellite technology has been uh, created under the previous uh, five-year plans. And now uh, China is putting more uh, energy on creating the undersea observation network. And those data are 
combined by the central authority and used as an integrated form. So uh, this is the this is Xi Jinping uh, inspecting uh, the UAV, <laughs> and uh, behind him uh, it says uh, maritime 3D observation network. So uh, this uh, maritime institute in Sanya, uh, Hainan province, uh, has been creating those uh, undersea network. And those are the examples of the networks. So, um, uh, uh, well, this is the end of my uh, presentation. We are, I think uh, we're uh, if looking, we're seeing, you know, huge change uh, of China. Um, uh, of course, uh, we have uh, many uh, traditional concerns, but I think I can clearly see that China is creating a huge type of you know, new infrastructure, spatial infrastructure. And uh, I wanted to uh, emphasize that we also need to uh, prepare the new capability China may have in, in terms of their own maritime uh, domain awareness. So thank you very much. Uh, I would uh, very much looking forward to receive your comments. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Masuo. Um, why don't we uh, turn it over to uh, Jonathan? Well, thanks so much, Philip uh, and uh, Masao Sensei. Uh, you literally cover the waterfront of uh, of strategic issues with uh, with such uh, robust and comprehensive insights. So, uh, uh, let me add a few things. But I really appreciated uh, your insights uh, and your deep understanding of Chinese maritime strategy. Uh, and not only that, but the the different nuances involved, which I think sometimes uh, aren't always fully understood. Um, so uh, I'll make a couple comments just on your presentation and then uh, get into a little bit about Japanese security policy and, and uh, some of those questions that you posed, which I think are very important questions. Uh, I'm not going to pretend I have all the answers, but I think Japan uh, right now, especially at this time with the end of this year uh, and a range of different national security and defense documents coming out, uh, is thinking deeply specifically on those questions that that you provoked uh, Maso Sensei. So let me try to get into those a little bit later with my insights. But first, I wanted to point out, um, you know, I really enjoyed your your sort of analysis on how the goalposts are shifting. Uh, and you used the Senkaku, obviously, as the first example of this. Uh, 2012, obviously, China taking that uh, as a pretext moment. Uh, to shift the goalposts. Um, I think uh, your analogy to what's happening right now in Taiwan is an interesting and good analogy too. Uh, just one point I wanted to make on that is that I see this uh, shifting of the goalposts uh, in a dynamic spectrum. So when I say that, it's not that it's a one-off uh, and the goalposts, goalposts shift, so to say, and China makes its move, but it's a consistently evolving thing. Um, and in that sense, I, I was really happy that you shared that uh, slide on um, the, uh, the maritime vessels, the incursions around the Senkaku. And you pointed out that it, sometimes if you look at that, that graph itself, you might say, well, there's been some increases, especially in the past couple of years um, with incursions in the contiguous zone, um, but it doesn't tell the whole story. And I think you, you, uh, you rightly elaborated in a few things such as the, the different ways and manners which China is changing uh, the game. And part of that is the time, uh, for example, that Chinese vessels uh, spend around those um, those islands. The other thing is the airspace as well, uh, and the incursions in the airspace above. Um, and the third interesting point to me um, is the manner in which they're doing that with and the partners that they're doing it with. So I think um, one of the wild cards, I think, for all of these questions that you pose um, is, frankly, the, the Russia-China relationship. I think there's been a couple different examples, um, of course, in the East China Sea as well around the Senkaku, but also in the North. Um, and whether this is a strategic distraction, um, there's several questions whether Russia has the long term capabilities uh, to continue to uh, to conduct these exercises with the Chinese, especially with their uh, strategic uh, mess that they've made for themselves uh, with their war in Ukraine. Um, but this is a, is a sig significant challenge that I think the Japanese have to face in addition to all of the challenges uh, that you referenced with, with China. Um, so, uh, and the last thing I will note before I, I get into a bit of how Japan might be looking at this is when thinking about how these, uh, these goalposts are shifting and how uh, China is creating pretexts, 
Uh, I'm looking at the South China Sea potentially next. Uh, we know that they've already used uh, this sort of uh, modus operandi in the South China Sea before, um, but what might be the next sort of pretext that China uses to uh, take another step uh, in the South China Sea, um, whether this is through formally declaring uh, an ADIS, an air defense identification zone, um, maybe it's not more land reclamation, maybe it is, um, but most likely it's even more advanced military equipment um, on some of the features that they've already claimed. Um, we already know that they've progressed in this direction, um, but whether they use some sort of pretext um, to increase uh, their, their activities and their assertiveness in the South China Sea is something that I'm going to be paying a lot of attention to in the coming, in the coming months. So, um, you know, before handing it over to Eric, a couple of things I wanted to talk about. Um, first is how Japan um, more broadly will be looking at maritime security issues, how it already does. Uh, and so what are the, the, the sort of pillars that they focus on? And the second thing, what are the, the drivers of engagement? So how do they actually achieve those pillars? And, and how is that going to be possible in this very muddied strategic situation that, that Japan finds itself in um, increasingly? So the first, I think, you know, the most central document to look at in this terms is uh, its basic plan on ocean policy. Um, and I think the pillars of the way they engage, and I think you touched on China, in a sense, having some of these similar pillars, they, they may frame them in different ways, and they may not be organized the same ways in Japan. But these three pillars uh, are, number one, uh, protecting Japan's national interests in territorial waters. So obviously, uh, first and foremost, we think about uh, shoring up defense over the Senkaku Islands um, in the East China Sea. But this is not purely over the Senkaku. We've seen increasingly uh, incursions close to Japan's territorial waters um, in, in other areas uh, by Chinese vessels, not just the Senkaku. So that, that's also uh, concerning for Japan. The second uh, key area, I think, uh, for Japan going forward will be uh, the stable use of Japan's uh, SLOC, so the sea, sea Lines of Communications. And this is one um, that you'll see embedded in many of Japan's strategic documents, so not just as it relates to ocean policy, but you'll see, for example, in Japan's uh, regional grand strategy, the free and open Indo-Pacific vision, uh, a consistent reference to uh, sea lines of communication. This is something that's not just a military term um, or, or a security term, but, but refers to economic security as well. I mean, this is as something that Japan will not be able to deal with just by itself or just with the US alliance, uh, but in tandem with, with other partners. And, and I think that goes uh, to the third pillar, um, which will be strengthening international maritime order um, and the freedom of use of the oceans. So obviously uh, upholding, buttressing in as many forms as possible, um, unclose and all related documents. And this is something Japan, I, I think, through its raft of diplomacy, uh, through its engagement of like-minded partners in the region, has really been uh, putting quite a, an emphasis on. Obviously, the Abe administration put a good priority on this, and I don't expect there to be any significant change uh, now with the Kishida administration. So if those are the three main pillars uh, that Japan thinks about in maritime security terms, uh, how will it actually be able to achieve these? Um, and I see three main drivers or sort of vehicles of engagement that Japan has to, to achieve those pillars. Um, they're not new uh, um, vehicles of engagement in many ways, they're, they're tried and tested, but I think Japan's realizing with its security environment evolving, it needs to involve the way it engages as well. Um, so the first one and the first obvious uh, way to engage is through the US-Japan alliance. Um, and not just engage with the Americans, but uh, find ways to enhance that engagement, to evolve that engagement. Much of that work obviously has been a work in progress for decades. We saw, for example, under the Abe administration, um, continue work towards building a seamless alliance, revised bilateral defense guidelines, uh, collective self-defense. And I think you rightly mentioned potential um, contingency over Taiwan, for example, uh, protection of allied uh, assets, so this, the alliance has been moving in many ways in this regard, but I think there's, we're going to have to continue to see more and more um, uh, niftiness in the way that the U.S.-Japan alliance uh, works together uh, in order to meet some of these challenges. The second uh, uh, driver of engagement, I think this one is going to be very, very important, and I think we've seen a significant amount of effort, um, especially from 2016 onwards, is the US-Japan X um, format, but also what I call the Japan XX format. 
So this is uh, complementary uh, partnerships, uh, defense partnerships, security partnerships um, that work in tandem with the U.S. alliance. This is not about hedging against the U.S. partnership, but this is about hedging into the U.S. Uh, alliance. So obviously, uh, one of the, the gold standard ones that we think about is, is the U.S., uh, Japan, Australia, um, trilateral, the trilateral strategic dialogue, uh, the quad obviously playing a role. But it's not only this. I mean, I like to sometimes point out uh, some of the uh, Japanese minilaterals that do not involve the United States, because some of them are important as well. Uh, one example of this would be uh, the Japan, India, Australia trilateral, um, which works. Uh, and, and there is some benefit in having some engagements that, uh, while they feed into the U.S. alliance, aren't necessarily hinged off the U.S. alliance. So that's the second driver. And the third driver that I think Japan uh, is deeply thinking about, and this gets me to the end of the year and how important this is uh, for the raft of defense documents, is Japan domestically. So Japan thinking about it in its, in its, uh, its own way, uh, how it should be contributing to its own national defense and security and maritime security. So, uh, you know, the most authoritative document that we're going to have to look forward to this year will be a new national security strategy. Uh, obviously, the first one being, um, you know, quite a significant precedent, the first ever uh, Japanese national security strategy in 2013 uh, with the creation of the National Security Council and, and many important milestones. But I think that we can all agree that we are not in 2013. Uh, things have drastically changed uh, in Japan's environment and the global environment. Um, I think one of the most marked changes um, would be to think of Russia, for example. Uh, Russia was identified as a, as a partner in uh, the 2013 uh, national security strategy. Um, we don't have to get into the, the, into the history of, of Japan-Russia relations under the Abe administration, but clearly there was some motivation to, to look at Russia in, in more of a potential partner role. That clearly will not be uh, the position that Russia finds itself in in this uh, new national security strategy. But I think uh, Maslow Sensei, as you identified correctly in your presentation, the story, the long-term story is not necessarily Russia, uh, but it's how China has evolved uh, since 2013 uh, in capability ways, uh, in the ways that they're approaching some of these regional disputes. The South China Sea, obviously, there's many instructive lessons there, uh, but we're also seeing this with their ability to shift the goalposts vis-a-vis uh, -vis Taiwan, even by firing ballistic missiles in Japan's uh, EEZ, which per perhaps wouldn't be something that they would consider as an option in 2013. Um, so uh, the last sort of point that I'll mention here is that, and I, you know, I have to do a shameless plug here for Canada as the, as the lone, uh, you know, well, the second Canadian here with, with Philip, um, is that, uh, you know, in this Japan XX model and also in the Japan USX model, there are a role for, for other uh, players to, uh, to, to, to take a, a stand here. One example I'll mention to you, and I mean, this may not seem as, as relevant to China, but the Operation Neon uh, exercises which are happening uh, to ensure that North Korea is unable to circumvent or at least try to dull the amount of circumvention of, of UN sanctions over its WMD program. Canada has been participating in that since its infancy. And I think with Russia's war in Ukraine, it was a real, you know, for a lot of countries, obviously, uh, especially those who have scarce resources, you have to make certain choices. And I think there was a lot of thought process, even in the naval terms, about uh, potentially we need to reallocate some of those assets uh, to Europe uh, and support uh, our European allies uh, as a NATO member. I think the decision and the right decision was made uh, to keep our, our mission in Operation Neon. Of course, we can still do much for our Ukrainian friends um, and show our resilience as a NATO member, but still ensure that, um, that there are uh, security situations in the Pacific that, that do need uh, a Canadian uh, voice as well. So I'm hoping as, uh, as our Indo-Pacific strategy um, may come out uh, within the coming months uh, that you see more and more uh, support for issues such as this. So thanks again, and I'll, uh, I'll pass it off to, uh, to Eric. Well, thank you both for the uh, thought-provoking and very much complimentary uh, remarks. Uh, yeah, so Eric, uh, why don't we turn it over to you? Well, uh, thanks, Philip. Uh, I'll also extend my thanks to the, the Monk School, the consulate, um, Masuo Sensei, for a really fantastic presentation, and Jonathan for his great uh, follow-up. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more narrowly about uh, military issues as they pertain especially to kind of high-end conflict. So the nature of my 
comments will be a little bit different, but I think they do connect to the broader questions about maritime security and the types of, uh, say, gray zone conflict that uh, Masuo Sensei spoke to. Um, the behavior of all states is profoundly affected by the, their understanding of the balance of power, and that's no less true, certainly, in the maritime domain in Asia than it is elsewhere. If uh, the Japanese government had purchased the Senkaku Islands in, say, 1990 instead of 2012, the Chinese reaction, I think, might have been uh, uh, quite different. And at the same time, concerns about high-end conflict or sort of core issues of national security against attack affect the tools that may or may not be available to Japan as it thinks about, you know, how to adjust its procurement. Um, and certainly the scale of the problem in terms of, you know, really just the simple presence of Japanese, uh, I'm sorry, of Chinese military assets is affected by uh, material considerations. So I'm just really going to touch on three topics. The first is the evolving balance of power, just to provide some context. Um, the second, the nature of evolving military technology, and then some of the implications for Japanese security policy from, from those two areas. Um, you know, obviously the balance of power has evolved uh, quite rapidly in Japan's, uh, I'm sorry, China's overall military capabilities now outstrip if they don't really sort of uh, dwarf Japan's. You all know this, so I don't want to belabor it, um, but I still think it's important to sort of provide some context. The situation in Asia is just so much different from Europe, where, say, Germany's GDP and, and defense budget, for that matter, I think, um, outstrips that of, of uh, Russia's. Um, defense spending is certainly an imperfect uh, surrogate or measure of military power, but it's, it's probably the best place to start, and it's worth reminding ourselves that in 2000, Japan's defense budget was still greater than that of China's, whereas, you know, fast forward to today, China's defense spending is something like six times that of Japan's. Uh, if you compare the number of major military systems or hardware, the gap isn't as large since those in inventories reflect procurement over a period of uh, 20 years or so. Nevertheless, a significant gap is uh, evident and growing. So on the naval side, uh, China now operates about 20 I'm sorry, twice the number of major surface combatants that Japan does. On the air side, the gap's a little bit bigger. Um, so even if you're just looking at modern combat aircraft, China has something on the order of three times um, the number of aircraft that uh, Japan's aircraft does. At the same time, um, despite the fact that Japan certainly has cutting edge uh, defense industries that reflect the power of Japan's economy overall, the qualitative picture too is not really as positive as one might imagine. So in terms of systems that are being acquired today, Japan's weapons are, I would say, as good as or perhaps better than uh, Chinese systems. But if you look at those inventories, the ones I spoke to acquired over the last 20 years, many of Japan's systems are older and have been in the inventory for some time. And after decades of flat budgets, which are changing today, but only very recently and relatively slowly even now, um, those older systems haven't been modernized adequately. Um, so for example, Japan today is acquiring F-35s that restores um, a measure of advantage to Japan in the very high end of the you know, air to air conflict scenarios. But many of China's fourth generation aircraft are more modern than those of Japan's uh, having been modernized over time. So despite the fact that Japan invented very important military technology, ASA radar, um, uh, actively uh, electronically scanned array radar, Few Japanese aircraft today are equipped with it while it's becoming standard kit on Chinese aircraft. And the pattern sort of holds across the board uh, on, the, on, the, on the naval side as well. Obviously, Japan doesn't stand alone. We've talked about the US alliance. US capabilities have to be taken into account. But it's also worth remembering that only about 10 to 15% of US military assets are forward deployed in East Asia. So, in a conflict, um, some US reinforcements could flow into theater in a matter of days, but others would take weeks or months. So, uh, you know, just to foot stomp the fact that uh, Japan's concerns, not just about Chinese behavior, but about the balance of power itself and really core security interests are both um, very reasonable, uh, real and quite reasonable. Uh, a second topic, hopefully it's not too tangential, I think it 
I think it's important to the understanding of sort of maritime events, has to do with uh, military technology and its evolution, um, and particularly the vulnerability of uh, warships and really traditional air bases as well. Uh, so when you talk about maritime conflict today, so actual warfare today, especially in the ar archipelagic en environment, one like Japan, where there are land features as well, you have to consider sort of the sum of, you know, a variety of types of capabilities. Fleets, surface ships, air power, and missiles have to be taken as, you know, kind of a complete package. Aircraft, of course, have been important in this environment for something on 80 years, so that's not at all a new thing. What is new, though, is the range and accuracy of missiles and the fact that they can have um, really devastating effects at great distances, uh, not instantly, but in you know very rapid or short time frames. So just to provide a little bit of context about what I'm talking about here, in 1982, we had the Falklands uh, War between Argentina and Britain. At that time, Argentina had five, count them on one hand, five air-launched Exocet anti-ship missiles, the range was 70 kilometers. Those five Argentine missiles uh, gave the British no end of heartburn. They hit, um, uh, they scored three hits and sank two ships. More importantly, maybe they held the British fleet at bay for something like three weeks. Now, again, fast forward to 2022 and the missile threat is completely different. It's completely metamorphosized. Missiles are now literally counted in the thousands, and many have ranges in excess of 1,000 kilometers. Um, many, many have ranges in excess of 400 kilometers. Some have ranges in excess of 1,000 kilometers. Seeker heads are much more sophisticated. The missiles talk to each other. In other words, they're already sort of swarms. Um, shipboard defenses have evolved, but not nearly by the same extent. So not only do these missiles outrange shipboard defenses, but the number of defensive interceptors on board ships is limited, really uh, uh, hasn't changed uh, nearly enough, and defenses can therefore be overwhelmed. So uh, my point in saying all this is that in maritime warfare and sort of high-end conflict, both sides ships within, say, 1,500 or 2,000 kilometers of the Chinese coast, certainly within that range of each other, would be highly vulnerable. Um, that cuts various different ways when you think about different uh, scenarios and the quote unquote offense defense balance. And it's not all bad news. So even though this sounds terrible, it's not all bad news. So for example, I, I think you know the, the evolution of military technology makes an invasion of Taiwan far more difficult for China than it would be without the existence of sec technologies if this tech, if this evolution had not taken place. So in that context, the context in which someone has to actually cross water and invade another country, um, it's of great value to the defender. On the other hand, depending on geography, uh, blockade might become more effective. I think in the Japanese context, you know, the concern is there's sort of a, a very large middle ground that might be described as mutually denied, where it would be really difficult for both sides to operate uh, naval ships, particularly at the initial stages of conflict. And then, you know, returning at least for a moment to the gray zone conflict and military diplomacy, these things that Masuo Sensei spoke so eloquently about, it means that the iconic assets that are employed in that kind of conflict, warships and coast guard ships, may not be all that useful or survivable in a shooting war. So we have these things, um, you know, very valuable in one context, but really much less valuable than they used to be, or at least, you know, in an immediate sense than, than they once were. And I should say that traditional air bases too have become more vulnerable to missile attacks. That's a separate uh, topic that I, I won't speak to now, but it, it's uh, ground truth. Okay, um, so what are the implications of both of these trends for Japanese uh, thinking? Um, you know, clearly Japanese angst has increased uh, pretty dramatically given these trend lines in uh, regional security and technology. Um, Japan is making greater efforts. I think Jonathan spoke to, you know, some of this. Um, it's making greater efforts to deepen military and strategic relations with other regional states and European uh, nations, especially the United Kingdom, and of course, its longstanding US ally. I think there's already a question in Q&A about you know, whether Japan might be hedging against alliance failure. I think Jonathan 
put it extremely well, hedging sort of into the U.S. alliance rather than against it. But I have to say there's discussion in Japan about a quote unquote plan B. Um, I don't think that's terribly realistic. And I view that their diplomatic engagement as being much more uh, along the lines of what Jonathan described. All right, Jonathan already spoke to uh, the free and open Indo-Pacific FOIP. I, you know, he's absolutely right that this is, you know, an, an umbrella diplomatic strategy. Its most important elements are economic, but it does have military elements as well. Um, within the region, Japan's most important strategic ties are clearly with the regional mil middle powers. So that's Australia. And again, Jonathan spoke to that and India. So Japan became a permanent member of India's uh, Malabar exercises. Those are annual naval exercises. Japan became a permanent member in 2015. And under that rubric last year, we saw India, the United States, Australia, and Japan exercise in both the Philippine Sea, which, you know, need not remind you is off the coast of the Philippines, and in the Bay of Bengal. Um, trilateral security dialogue between the US, Japan, and Australia has been institutionalized and upgraded. Uh, Japan and Australia have concluded an acquisition and cross-service agreement, or AXA, which makes cooperation, you know, practical cooperation easier. And there's some talk of Japan joining the AUKUS agreement, which I suppose would make it JAUKUS. Now, the centerpiece of AUKUS is the nuclear submarine deal with Australia, but it does have other components that I think Japan could quite easily plug into, you know, whether or not that's formally under the auspices of, of uh, AUKUS or not. And of course, Japan's engagement, its military to military engagement now also increasingly includes Southeast Asian states. So it does exercises in the South China Sea, it does port visits to various uh, Southeast Asian countries. And it's concluded some weapon sales to the Philippines and is pretty far along in negotiating a very significant sale to Indonesia, eight frigates. That would be a, an enormous, um, you know, step, precedent breaking step for Japan. The most problematic area of cooperation is with um, Korea, and we could talk about that. Um, but even there, there have been some breakthroughs. So last month, the two navies, Japan and, and Korean navies, took part in an exercise off Hawaii where I, I believe for the first time ever, it's hard to sort of um, confirm that, but I believe for the first time ever, they shared data on tactical data links. So direct, you know, electronic sharing of uh, missile data. Um, now, this doesn't all cut one way. You know, thus far I've spoken about Japan becoming more active and both in its diplomacy and with its budgets and such. Um, but I would say as far as the geographic sc scope of Japan's um, defense focus, the, uh, the evolving balance of power cuts uh, multiple ways. On the one hand, it's more concerned about potential losses in Southeast Asia and Taiwan. And as Jonathan said, that threats to its slocks and sea lines of communication, if China makes gains there. <laughs> On the other hand, uh, I think the evolving balance of power leaves it less bandwidth um, for it to play a major role in global security, an aspiration that it had immediately following the Cold War. Um, so I think as it's, you know, as it moves forward, its horizons may shrink a bit. I would definitely not exaggerate that. Um, none of this is to say that Japan isn't or won't be a global actor. I think for one thing, it understands that European uh, states play a, a role in Asian security and uh, Japan will want to reciprocate but as far as military presence and activity and procurement, I think it's going to be focused more on narrower defense requirements and somewhat closer to home, even if that does stretch to Southeast Asia. All right. And by way of just quick conclusion, I'll just add a few comments on uh, the military side, military equipment and acquisition. Um, Japan has pledged to fundamentally strengthen its defense within five years, and it's cited the, the NATO target of 2% of GDP. So in other words, Japan has sort of made a soft commitment to double the percentage of GDP that it spends on defense over, say, the next five years. I'm not sure it's going to make it there, but still, this is quite significant. Uh, and the content of Japanese defense programs is changing. Now, you'll hear a lot about this. I would caution folks that not all new procurement is necessarily adaptive or rationally responsive to the environment, um, even though it will always be sold that way. Some of it may simply reflect sort of existing bureaucratic 
preferences um, or you know status concerns. So it's really worth looking at individual programs and the content of the 2023 um, uh, defense budget proposal offers some clues about where it might be headed there. Some items in that are clearly adaptive since they both meet new challenges and do not comport with existing bureaucratic interests or longstanding sort of desires on the part of the military. I would say there we could um, cite the reintroduction of smaller warships after decades of moving towards larger ships. Um, you know, a trend that or a change that really reflects budgetary realities as well as the advice of you know numerous analysts over the year. Um, some items or probably most items represent or reflect a mix of existing preferences and, and, and rational responses. So the MOD is now going big on the development and acquisition of long range strike in the form of longer range uh, missiles. Um, it's converting helicopter destroyers to small aircraft carriers and buying fixed wing assets to put on them and strengthening cyber and space capabilities, as well as, you know, acquiring large ships as well as small ships. So I would say in all those cases, there's sort of a mix of, uh, of drivers involved. And then finally, last, I would just say there are still really what I think have to be described as dysfunctional aspects of Japan's military system or procurement. Just cite two examples. The first is that the army remains the dominant service in terms of budget share, and that is changing at really glacial speed, um, if that, uh, you know, this is predominantly and overwhelmingly a maritime and air environment, and uh, the Army's role is going to be fairly modest. And then a second point is just that um, Japan today lacks a standing joint command and its sort of joint capabilities, its jointness is, is extraordinarily weak, um, you know, by comparative standards. That may change, but the lack of that jointness, the lack of a, a joint a standing joint command does reflect sort of long term service suspicion of, of such an organization. So I'll stop there and uh, hopefully we've got a bit of time for discussion. Thanks. Oh, thank, thank you, Eric. Uh, so, so this was uh, extremely comprehensive and thought provoking. I invited some of my uh, students to attend this session, and I think that they got, uh, you know, about as uh, good of an introduction to the contemporary security issues that animate Japanese pol foreign policy thinking uh, as one could get. So thank you, um, uh, all three of you, uh, for that. Um, I do want to um, provide some uh, room for questions from the audience, um, and I and I think um, one question that came in uh, is is a very uh, 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 a good one to pose to you, um, and, and that comes from Brandon Wallace about essentially the Indo-Pacific strategies of um, both Canada and the United States and how it relates to some of the issues that we've been discussing here. Of course, the one uh, that Canada is developing is, is something that uh, I received a lot of questions about when I was in Japan this summer uh, about when it's likely to be uh, uh, available as well as what the content is is likely to include, and that might be more of a, a question uh, to Jonathan. Uh, but uh, if if um, uh, Masosense and Eric might have some thoughts on the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy as well, Jonathan, do you have uh, any? Yeah, I can go yeah. first. Uh, go ahead. And I'll try to be really quick. Um, you know, first of all, on the U.S. strategy, I'll, I'll focus most of it on the Canadian strategy, but. Um, the one thing, I mean, again, to, to join the choir of, of many uh, others in D.C. saying this, but um, I, I think there's very good elements of the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, the main fundamental challenge, obviously, is the balance. And I think this balance has been one that's been a challenge for a long time. I won't bring up the the, uh, the acronym that shall not be shall not be said. Um, but uh, economic and trade um, uh, element needs to be strengthened. And I think that is the one element uh, with the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy that remains lacking. I know IPEF is, is a, you know, a solid effort, I think, uh, from the Biden administration to rectify that. Um, but that's the one, I think, challenge uh, that the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy has. The one thing I would note, and maybe I'll connect this to the Canadian side, is that um, Canada, if you do a word search, in the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy for Canada, you do not find it once, um, and uh, that probably doesn't surprise me. Um, you know, uh, a lot of uh, Canadians here, we, we, you know, we like to be seen uh, somewhere in U.S. documents. So when we're not seen, we we get all uh, flustered or hot under the collar. 
Um, but I think it brings up an interesting sort of segue to Canada because often when it comes to this part of the world um, we're seen as somewhat invisible not necessarily um, bad uh, um, you know most of the countries in the region want to see a, a more um, principled Canada in the region but they just don't really notice or think of Canada when they think of you know for example Eric when you mentioned uh, you know the the relationship with the UK I think France for example is seen as a natural sort of partner for Japan uh, in addition to the quad, um, you know, Canada sort of comes further down the list. Um, so I think as we, you know, what I hope to see in this strategy and what I think I expect we, we may see um, is a more focus on the balance from our side of, of actually the opposite of what I said for the U.S. is getting the security side, uh, paying some attention to that. Um, the reality is, I think, for us to think maybe 15 or 20 years ago uh, that we could uh, just uh, engage in this part of the world uh, on trade agreements and uh, foreign investment, um, you know, doesn't fully appreciate some of the challenges that I think Maso Sensei and Eric mentioned about the real security issues here. Um, so that's really my hope for the Indo-Pacific strategy. It's not that it becomes a security first strategy that the Royal Canadian Navy, you know, puts 75% uh, of its fleet uh in yokosuka or something like this but the idea that we we have a real serious appreciation uh of the security challenges in this part of the world uh and that we work much more closely with with allies like japan uh in addressing them great thank you uh eric or maso sensei any uh, thoughts on the indo-pacific strategy please um, thank you very much for uh, Jonathan's and uh, Eric's uh, wonderful comments and uh, wonderful questions from the audience. Um, uh, combining all of them, uh, I just wanted to add a little bit. Um, I think our Indo-Pacific strategy can be uh, varied depending on the country. As, actually, I think uh, this kind of diversity is very important. Um, uh, well, uh, today's uh, workshop, uh, I think, uh, uh, illustrated that uh, Japan is in a very difficult position dealing with China. Uh, and probably we are at the front line together with Taiwan uh, in the face of uh, you know this type of uh, geographical uh, well, uh, changes of the world. Uh, but um, uh, I wanted to emphasize that uh, it is our biggest interest to coexist with China. As long as Chinese behaviors are kept, you know, in a healthy way, that's okay. If they do not, you know, coerce us, it's okay. So uh, for us, uh, the main maintaining, you know, free and open Indo-Pacific is very important. And uh, I think uh, the United States can play a role to, you know, uh, you know, form a balance with China in terms of the power. But uh, probably uh, Japan's role uh, can be a little bit different and Canada's role will be different. But I hope uh, uh, Canada can play a bigger role to shape, to shape uh, the new um, uh, regional order in the Indo-Pacific region. Of course, the maintaining uh, the original order and the free and open uh, is very important, but probably uh, at the same time, I can see uh, the global South, including China, wants to have more say in this new system. And I, I think it's almost impossible for us to, uh, you know, deter them, uh, you, know, uh, you know, have more voices in the new uh, architecture. So uh, we need to change a little bit, you know, the way we operate the system. But, you know, uh, in this, uh, maybe it's not always Japan, uh, you know, uh, who, uh, you know, try to shape the order. Yeah, actually, uh, smaller countries, can play a bigger role in shaping this type of order. And I really want to uh, ask uh, Canadian colleagues to uh, support us in this way. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and unfortunately, we're just about out of time. So Eric, I'll give you the last uh, word, uh, either on this question or uh, any observations that you might have. Sure, just very briefly, uh, you know, I would echo uh, what Masuo Sensei just said about uh, Canada's role to include in the, you know, in the in the political military environment. So it may not have the capabilities that the United States has, but, uh, but, you know, all nations have sort of one voice in the realm of military diplomacy, not quite an equal voice, but but a significant voice in the realm of military diplomacy. And as sad as it is for me to 
say Canada has a certain type of moral authority sometimes that the United States, at least in the views of some, uh, you know, occasionally lacks. So I think it, it does have a very important role to play, uh, you know, if it's willing to put some skin into the game. So the, you know, I, I'm not trying to say that the assets or the, you know, the, the hard engagement is not important to the contrary, but I think it, it then, um, you know, has outsized benefits, you know, sort of ship for ship or plane for plane. So I think Canada does have a very important role to play uh, in the Pacific. Uh, from the U.S. perspective, couldn't agree more that U.S. policy is, you know, highly imbalanced. Uh, you know, giving up on TPP was, you know, an incredible self-inflicted wound from which, you know, we may or may not be able to recover. Obviously, it will take some time if we can do it at all. Um, my father passed away this year, and I was able to read some of, uh, you know, his past writings and writings about him. He was closely involved in, uh, you know, in, in initiating and orchestrating um, uh, the APEC, Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation uh, Organization. Um, you know, but we haven't had too many initiatives like that since. So yes, I couldn't agree more that U.S. Um, policy is badly uh, imbalanced and that that hurts our position in Asia um, in many ways. Finally, I would just say about the U.S. position, this has much less to do with strategy than with public opinion. Um, but since I'm, you know, have recently migrated, I say recently, it was about six years ago. I'm old now, so everything's recent. But, um, you know, migrated from the think tank world to the academic world. I'm, I'm quite struck, particularly in academia, but, uh, you know, as well in the political world and probably in public opinion uh, by sort of the inability of, the, of many to, to appreciate the very great difference between the balance of power in Asia and the balance of power in Europe. So there's strong sentiment in the United States to have others pick up more of the burden of defense and security. That makes sense in Europe. Obviously, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has thrown something of a monkey wrench into that. But that is simply not possible for the U.S. to be disengaged in Asia and for there to be any semblance of a balance of power there. And I know we are now out of time, but thank you very much again for, for this opportunity. Well, thank you so much uh, to all of the panelists and to the audience members as well, uh, uh, very much uh, uh, to be continued. Um, and I would like to note that uh, for those of you in Toronto, uh, we will continue this conversation uh, with an in-person event on September 30th with Adam Liff from Indiana University. He'll be covering Japan-Taiwan policy. And so I'll look forward to seeing some of you there. And apologies that we couldn't get to all of your questions. Uh, time flies when you're having fun and so forth. Uh, but I would also like to thank uh, the Consul General uh, of Japan in Toronto uh, for their co-sponsorship of this event. Uh, and uh, thank you all. And I, I hope that you have a good night or good morning, I suppose, <laughs> for those of you in Japan. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. you. So much.